hellos to everyone. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Good to have you here. Uh, who else? Max Ritchie's back, everyone. Max Ritchie. Remember, a great way to support this show, hi, Shanna Banana, is we have the Super Chat, which is open right now. Give us a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button if you are new. And we're going to great show tonight with Science Bob and Matt Lay, our special guest. We're going to get going in like five seconds. Hey, hey, Ron, good to see you. Hey, there's Science Bob in the chat room. He's double dipping tonight. Yes, he is double dipping. of Central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, we have them free for you at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Each and every month, we bring in our resident scientist, Bob McGuire, to discuss the scientific side of the supernatural and paranormal. Tonight, Science Bob, as we know him around here, takes a good look at the practical and scientific side to the high strangeness that surrounds us with our special guest, Matt Lay. Now, Matt has been involved in the paranormal for well over three decades. The United States Air Force veteran, a veteran again, thank you, Matt, for serving your beautiful country and all of North America. He now lives in... Saskatchewan, married to fellow paranormal investigator, the lovely and talented Allison Ford. However, Matt has a nicer beard. Now, Matt has created the Medutu Effect, bringing over 35 years of research and practice into the occult and metaphysical realm. We're going to find out what that all means coming up on Science Bob and Friends. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire, brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Science Bob, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, guys. How's it going? It's always a pleasure to have a little science Bob around here because, you know, Bob, I'm going to be honest with you. You you make us all feel a little bit smarter after this show is done. Well, uh, I hope I do because I love to have fun here. Well, we love you. We love you. Now, we're kind of taking a little bit of a, of a different course because your first few episodes as we started this, you we've really been focusing on UFOs. And, yes, we did the episode with Skinwalker Ranch. But tonight is really our first foray of Science Bob and Friends into the paranormal. What do you think of that change? Oh, I love it. We, we, there's, a, there's scientific stuff to be done in all these areas. And I think you and I both believe that the underlying um, work to be done on consciousness is a big deal in all these fields. And we're going to learn more about that. We bring in our special guest tonight, Matt Lay. He is from the beautiful province of Saskatchewan and married a good Canadian kid in Allison after, you know, being born and raised and serving a beautiful country of the United States of America in the United States Air Force. Matt, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for your service, my friend. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be on the show. Absolutely, my friend. It, it is a pleasure to have you here as well. You know, everybody has a story here, and I'm sure I'll start things off for Science Bob because he's going to be loaded with questions coming up. But, Matt, you have been a, a lifelong paranormal experiencer. You, you're an investigator. Tell Science Bob and everybody about you. Well, uh, <laughs> well, let's just start with at a very young age I was exposed to um, – occult practices and uh but not more necessarily as a path but more research and of course growing up being young and in the south yeah you take it for a black and white textbook environment and 
uh, as you grow older and uh, plus, you know, I was a combat com uh, journeyman with the Air Force and you start learning more on the technical side of things and you start seeing the correlation between communication and uh, what we were doing in the magical practices and as also looking at the paranormal in the early 80s uh, and you look back at these things and you see a connection between them all so you know as that developed over time you know I formed multiple organizations over time but this is uh, a lifelong dream you know Medutu itself means knowledge so the Medutu effect means the knowledge effect and we're continually learning and growing from each other's experiences and the key point of that is open communication without prejudices or any type of hate you know and preconceived uh, notions of fear so but that's pretty much so the cliff notes version <laughs> science bob you want to hop in yeah well, matt what did, what did you do in the air force i was combat com i was a um uh what you call a Wideband technician, uh, did the SATCOM wideband, uh, anywhere from fiber to twisted pair to coax. Um, uh, we're, our slogan was first in, last out. Uh, so it's um, uh, our primary function was to set up all comms uh, and frontline communications. Were you at Wright Patterson? No, our command wing was out of Robbins Air Force Base out Robbins, of Macon, Georgia. Okay. Yeah. Did you but, ever spend any time at Wright Pat? No, I did not. Um, you know, the after, unfortunately, once you become combat com, you become the redheaded stepchild of the Air Force, and you uh, get attached to all Army bases. Um, uh, it's either Army or Marine Corps. So. Um, because we're, we are their, um, we were their backbone communication network, pretty much. So, all right. Well, uh, so did you uh, did you ever see any Foo Fighters when you were in the air? Any Foo Fighters in the yeah, air? Yeah, any UFOs? Yeah. Well, <laughs> not while I was in the Air Force, but I have plenty, plenty of personal experiences growing oh. up along the Gulf Coast. That's, where, where on the Gulf Coast were you? Originally, I'm from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, uh, so, so I was, my wife and I are both are from Grove Hill, Alabama. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know where that's at. Yeah, 69 <laughs> miles north of Mobile. That's terrific. Yep. And we, we, have a, we have a place in Gulf Shores. Oh, nice. See, now I'm a Dolphin Island kind of guy. There so. you go. So <laughs> I, 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 I spent... Uh, my my father was a minister, and he was on Dolphin Island Parkway, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the Dolphin Island Methodist Church for uh, seven years. So we're it's it's good old home week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got the Beard Club going on. We got the good old home week. Yeah, this is this is pretty neat. <laughs> That's good, man. I've never <laughs> been. I've never been to Alabama. You have to come, Dave. I plan on it. I plan on it as soon as this uh, this pandemic is over and the weather warms up and and uh, the fish are biting. I will be there. Well, I've plenty of fish here. Mm -hmm. I promise. <laughs> uh, Matt, uh, how long have you been doing the uh, paranormal? Um. Or how long has it been doing you? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a more more accurate question. Um, my first investigation was in 1986 or seven, and um, but yeah, after that it's all been freelance. Uh, usually, I've been called in because someone out of fear was proclaiming it was one thing or another, and um, and then my interest started peaking more and more as time went on. Okay, so, um, and you've you've started a new uh, group now that you've um, uh, uh, become an expat in Canada? Yeah, it, I was part of a, a paranormal team uh, called PAST, and uh, 
it's an amazing team, uh, amazing all the way around their approach, the whole nine yards. But do, mostly due to health reasons, I can't get out and do um, investigations anymore. And I usually came up uh, with uh, inventions and theories and whatnot. So what I've been doing is I recently I've broken away from past. I'm still supporting them. Um, but uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I formed a group called the Saskatchewan Occult Technology Group. And this is where we take some of the more outlandish theories and manifest them. Okay, manifest them, and do you build sensors for them? Anyway, from it's more for data collection, not necessarily for sensors. Um, and if I've got just a minute, my my view is is that the paranormal field has become more into de detecting, not data collection. And um, yeah, you know, we're always looking for the blinky lights. We are yes or no, or so. What are you talking to? We can only assume. So we're focusing more on data collection. Uh, I have two um, uh, individuals from the local college here in Saskatchewan. Um, I don't want to say their names. Uh, they, uh, they're developers, programmers, um, and very open-minded. And I uh, have another gentleman, Steve. Uh, he's literally like my right-hand guy. He's the one that runs all the tests. Uh, test equipment and he breaks down the analytics and he looks for correlations to connect the dots oh that sounds great matt dave yeah matt you know you are someone who recently wrote a book regarding paranormal 101 and in your own frustration in seeing how the paranormal really isn't helping the entire scientific part of investigation in rather than proving life after death or some sort of you know cosmic equation as to what is really going on what has the effects been since you have written that book well to, to be quite honest i thought it was going to be torches and pitchforks um because uh, i was very blunt and very open uh in the book about how people tend well there's a difference between enthusiasts and investigators and um and how people get wrapped up into the tv shows well uh i would actually been very shocked uh, the book has been very welcomed and a lot of teams are utilizing the book as their introductory to bring on new members to set up a guideline so it's it's actually been uh, really nice, actually. <laughs> Here I was putting plywood that on the windows, thinking I had a hurricane coming. <laughs> okay, but what was the purpose of doing that? Because so few people out there have actually taken the time to do what you do, yet everybody in the paranormal UFO Bigfoot world seems to have the same complaints. Well, the... The biggest reason I put the book out there was to get rid of, um, unfortunately, a lot of paranormal teams are being educated by TV shows. And they're watching these TV shows almost like it's a play-by-play -play book and not realizing, you know, uh, that it's, so a lot of it's very misleading. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to say the show or anything, but when you see a 12-foot-tall demon in a, in a seven-foot doorway, it kind of immediately should show up as a red flag. But unfortunately, the general public freak out when they just they ignore all the other details and say, demon, and that's where they get locked in on. So in the back of the book, I actually have an entire history and a dictionary of the common terms. Um, yeah, uh, you know things as something as simple as a feral cage, or um, a difference between a demon and a demon. Uh, you know the frequency ranges, uh, the uh, difference between white and uh, black noise, and you know everything else. Science Bob, you are someone who is relatively new to this field, but. You and I have talked many times off the air about how you were amazed at 
at the attitudes and the the you know the anarchic style of the way people investigate these phenomena without searching for any answers when, when you hear of matt trying to do something about that what does that say to you about him well no that's that's terrific because um i am now involved because of some experiences i had and from the beginning uh when i got in it was because i wanted to get answers to the phenomenon i was experiencing and the way i am equipped to approach that is of course trying to do uh, observational science through sensors uh and my interaction with you has been to uh help provide access and interaction with experiencers and to reach out to others uh, through this show. Uh, and I've had all sorts of interactions with people that are doing uh, interesting things, uh, but, but none that are doing the kind of focused observational science that Skyhub has been doing, for example, until we ran into Matt. So uh, that, I'm sorry, that was also willing to lay it out in the open and do it in public. So I, I just think it's good to uh, we run into Matt so we can have some woo conversation and figure out how to do uh, observational science about it and figure out from Matt how he and his group are, are, are doing it. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, that's the other part is that any of our findings, we've been publishing them. We have a YouTube channel. Um, uh, and we also do seminars here at the building uh, where we present all this. It's more not necessarily to say this is what it is. This is more so that people, because when people start asking questions, uh, you, you know, yourself, myself, will trigger another question. It's like Science Bob I mentioned to you earlier. It's not, we maybe look like we're looking for the answers, but we're actually looking at opening doors and uh, the ultimate goal here is the more evidence that we can share um, maybe that will spark someone else to question more uh, what they're doing and how they're doing it and maybe come up with additional theories every lecture class that we've had I'm not even going to call them now I'm going to call them workshops I do the presentation and people speak openly challenge it um, and everybody, including myself, we all come out of it learning more. And that's what I love doing uh, more than anything. Oh, that's terrific. Yes, yeah, just it's, it's, it's so needed to have some reasonable interaction uh, between people who are, are experiencing things and those who are trying to figure out how these things work in our physical universe, mm -hmm. uh, if, if we ever can. And so the things that have me excited are uh, there are ongoing real interest uh, in the uh, in finding a formula uh, or physical description for how consciousness works, and uh, we know now that there are multiple. It very interesting uh, pieces of science being done in and around uh, consciousness. Of st and the nice thing about the work in the last, let's call it five years, is that this work on consciousness is being done in ways that allow us to form testable hypotheses mm -hmm. and uh, so that we can do experimentation and gather evidence and then falsify the, the, the underlying uh, theories and so that they can be updated to account for the new observations. This is just br bread and butter to someone uh, like me, and I'm I just uh, very excited with what I'm finding since I got in. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like, uh, and I, I'm going to back up to a conversation that I had with the two uh, gentlemen from the college, and uh, they were asking about, you know, different theories that I had, and I held up... Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Goetia or Goetics, um, the art of, uh, there's a book by Colin uh, D. Campbell, The Art Goetia. And on the, all the sigils, magical sigils inside, 
I opened it up and I handed it to them and I said, okay, you tell me what they look like to you. Don't read the description. You tell me what they look like to you. And they're looking at them going, well, I see an inductor. I see an amplifier. I see solder points. And I'm going, exactly. Look at this King Solomon seal on the front. And it's basically, it's a Cassegrainian dish. So um, these are the things that we're looking at exploring. We're not taking it as a, yes, I'm a practitioner. I'm an occultist. Um, and I take these type of things very seriously. But there's also another side to this, just as much as it is for us on the consciousness side. Uh, you know, our biggest challenge right now is that, you know, magical practitioners and uh I, you know, I do meditation, I do channeling, I do all these different things. But the point is, is that once we reach to that state, uh, we know the concept of time based on our physical plane. Well, we're missing parts of the equation for the other planes because we don't know what that is. So, yeah, you know, that these are the small pieces of the puzzles that we're chasing. Matt, for a lot of people who may not know, the word occult always has some dirtiness around it, some evil around it, but that's not really what the word means. When you mean and you talk about the occult, what is your definition of that? Well, occult just means what's hidden, uh, mystery. Um, it, ultimately, we're using it in the context of what is hidden from us. So with with that and the fact that it's not evil it's not conjuring demons or or the spawn of satan or or horrific <laughs> witchcraft spells or anything you know there is a, a perception out there that you have to be careful with with what you were working on and what you were doing well it's no different um uh science probably get a kick out of this um my wife allison she's on the chat she came up with an idea that every time paranormal investigators were using their cameras all of a sudden they would die and there was these different um uh, activities happening so of course that leads you to chase after dc voltage so what we did is uh i took i made a small uh tesla coil uh using a 1.2 million volt transformer and pretty much made a plasma core using it so uh, so I can energize the area. Well, let's go to the, what you just said, Dave. All these things can be dangerous. I'm not going to lie. They can be. But so can the device that if you reach inside of it. <laughs> so Very it's true. A, so it's a, it's a perception thing. What you may call scary and evil, um, it, it's all induced out of fear of what we've been fed through propaganda media um, you know, the difference between uh, a Gregory, an angel, and a demon is a very fine line. It's all on which path you choose. Very true. Gentlemen, I'm going to get you to, you know, sit tight here because uh, I don't even have my glasses on. Hold on. Okay, we got like 25 seconds left here uh, before we have to go to break here on Spaced Out Radio. And I, I think what we want to get into here, Matt, and Science Bob, I'm sure you'll agree with this. We want to get into the down and dirty of the science behind ghost hunting, behind trying to establish some sort of scientific analogy on the paranormal phenomena. Not a lot of people are doing it out there, and so somebody's got to be one of the first. We know it's happening at Skinwalker Ranch. Is it happening anywhere else? Well, potentially in the province of Saskatchewan. Science Bob and friends with... Our resident scientist, Dr. Bob McGuire, and our special guest tonight, Matt Lay from the Madutu Effect. We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio coming up right after this. Good job, gentlemen. Good job. All right. That's fun. Couldn't see a damn <laughs> thing. I had to clean my glasses. Well, you quit squirting your eye juice on it. No, I, I. You know what? I was splitting firewood all day. Ah, sweating all over it. Yeah. Well, you no, know, it's the dust that comes up from when you split the firewood. Got it. The wood dust, and all of a sudden, it's like all over my glasses and and everything. In the beard. In the beard, <laughs> absolutely. Hate when that happens. 
Yep. Yeah, I was doing some yard work today and uh, getting ready for the hurricane, which is now not going to come here. It's going to go um, mostly east of us. Oh, nice. Yeah, we had a huge dump of snow uh, recently, so it's there's a lot of shoveling going on. Yeah, that's what I got done today. I called Science Bob tonight, and I was, like, just finishing up uh, uh, shoveling off my patio. Well, what I heard was the unbelievable dark skies in uh, your part of British Columbia. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get you got that dark that uh, northern darkness up in Saskatchewan too, don't you? Oh yeah, we could see the see the Milky Way, especially in the winter time. Just go out on your back porch and look up; it's great. Yeah, right over the house here, right over the house. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Science, Bob, you just got to come up. You just got to come. I can't up. wait. Tell tell the Canadians to open the border and uh, for a magic. The, the, we need some magic to help this uh, vaccination work on COVID. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait. We just got to make sure we plan accordingly, though, Science Bob, because I don't want you coming up here while I'm on my way down to Vegas. Uh, just make a detour and come straight to Saskatchewan. You can come here to the building. There's plenty of space. Yeah. Sounds very good. <laughs> Was that Allison in the background? Yeah. Yes. Yes, that was. Oh, she's so cute. She's so cute. Hey, hello. Hello, Dave. <laughs> hello, Allison. Can you just uh, do us a favor, Allison? Go out to your window there and give everybody a wave so North America can see you. I think she's doing it. I, I really do. <laughs> It's, it's either that or I got a major eye roll. Oh, she couldn't hear you. I got the earbuds in. So, yeah. you know, he's saying that you should play better so all of North America can see you. I have been. <laughs> <laughs> I'm facing west right now, so it doesn't work for me. <laughs> you should ask Matt how many times he shocked himself in the course of all this research. <laughs> I have a defib on site. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah, the 500,000 volt one. That one's the best one. That's the one that got me. That, that one. That's what turned your beard white? Yeah, that's the one that turned my beard white. <laughs> All right, guys, we have under two minutes. How you doing, Science Bob? I'm doing super duper. You're looking good tonight, my friend. Yeah, the beard's coming in. I can't. Uh, I can't let uh, talk Sharon into let me put on moose oil. Why? She does. She, the grosses her out to think about it. It's not real moose. Yeah, whatever. I'm telling you, the very thought of it grosses her out. See, I make my own. So, what, so. so now we have to go down the Gulf Shores now. Yeah, no. No, I want to get off and on. I'm going to go. I still want to see Gulf Shores. Okay, we'll just take the ferry and cross over and yeah, say hello that's... and then run back. Okay. It's the crowds I don't like. Oh. What, the hell is, what the hell is Gulf Shores? There's no that's ocean. That's where or... my vacation home is. Oh. <laughs> I'm thinking there's no Gulf Shores up in Saskatchewan. Are you closer to Orange Beach? Yeah, well, no, no uh, we're... We are uh, across the we're we're across the lagoon. Oh, okay. So uh, we had a uh, my my mother had a house on the lagoon, and it got blown away by Hurricane Frederick. Oh, and then we got a place. We decided, okay, we're going to get a little further away. So so we're not at, we're we're on the basically on the border with Foley with Gulf Shores. Yeah, I've got you a really good, uh, during our next break, I'll tell you the really good uh, uh, paranormal experience I had at uh, Dolphin Island. Great. All right, guys, we are on in 10 seconds. I want to say a big thank you to both Max Ritchie and Brett Lewis for the Super Chats tonight. Hello to all of our brand new listeners. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Here we go, everyone. Hey! 
Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott, and I'm sitting here at SOR headquarters surrounded by a few inches of snow. I was digging out tonight and cutting firewood all day long because that's what you do in the tundra of Canada. Hey, I want to remind you that if you missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Science Bob and Friends continues here tonight with the subject of the paranormal. Can we prove the existence of ghosts and other phenomena? Science Bob McGuire, formerly of Virginia Tech University, and our special guest tonight, Matt Lay. Science Bob, welcome back. I'm happy to be back. And Matt... Thank you. And your lovely beard. <laughs> Good to be back. <laughs> Both of us. <laughs> All right, Matt, I'll kick things off here. How do you study the paranormal? Never mind investigate. Everybody can investigate, but how do you study the paranormal scientifically? Well, the, big, the biggest thing is right away, quit trying to label everything you see. Uh, you question it. Um, uh, unfortunately, we get into this realm of trying to label it right away. You know, uh, it's kind of like the paradelia effect where you see a face in a mirror and immediately it's something. You know, you, you ignore the fact that there's um, distortions in the glass, you know, or anything along those lines. You, you step into a different realm. You start researching. You look into the past as well. Um, uh, like I said before, along the lines of the occult, um, you don't, a lot of people dismiss it, unfortunately, but there's a lot of really good information that's hidden, uh, <laughs> pardon the pun, uh, that's hidden in all the um, woodcuts and in the drawings. Um, so when you're studying the paranormal, um, and I'm using that as a very broad term, because it's not always about ghosts, it's not always about one aspect or another, you know, we look at it openly. And um, so this is a quick example. Can I explain one of the experiments we did recently? Please do. Please. Okay, so uh, there's a device called a DT meter. Um, uh, so the DT meter measures, it sends out um, pulses of data just ones and zeros, that's all it is, and over a 100-foot cable. And it looks for a time sequence when it comes back. Now, every time practitioners go into a circle, they often, oh, there's a generalized rule, no watches, no nothing. So it's a perception thing. The time seems to be different when they did their ritual. It's the same thing also when a uh, major occurrence happens on a paranormal investigation. You know, the vortexes you hear about. Um, uh, also, the same concept with uh, um, researching UFOs. You have that time uh, distortion. So, these are perceptions. Um, you check your time. There's time missing. Um, so, what we did is we did a control environment uh with practitioners and they opened a circle but we ran the dt meter probe right through the center of the circle so we can understand where this perception is coming from and sure enough we picked up uh, a time distortion not a whole lot but the thing is is that now we have hard data to pursue further it's not a concept of in the past what we've done is gone I've got a video on the YouTube channel where you hear my wife say, wow, it felt like that was only five minutes and it was 30 minutes long. Um, we've always relied on these perceptions and now we are getting hard data. We want to calculate what is these different occurrences. I mean, we're not just going to do it with that. We're going to be doing it with, uh, got a, a guy that's a yoga master um, he's well known here in uh, Regina. I want to get him in here. I want to check his heart rate. I want to check uh, 
uh, voltage variations in the body, you know, and the same concept. Want to let, check out the time distortions. All these things play a part in paranormal investigations or paranormal occurrences. So let me ask you this. Do you, are you a follower of and do you consider yourself to be uh, a follower of Charles Ford and do you consider yourself to be a Fortian? Uh, not a follower, uh, and I might have to explain who this is. Okay, so Charles Fort was in, uh, around in the early part of the 20th century, and uh, he, but he was born in the late 1800s, and he wrote a bunch of books and kind of started the scientific investigation without tying it to any one phenomenon. So he was interested in all anomalous phenomena that weren't currently being explained uh, by science, and he delved right into consciousness, but he was really just into paranormal uh, uh, things in general. And so do you know who John Tenney is? John Tenney is a really kind of a, a, a modern inheritor of uh, the Charles Fort's uh, work. He's done all sorts of shows. I just wondered if you knew of and considered yourself to be a Fortian, but uh, mm -hmm. that answers that. So, no, uh, but I am writing these names down so I can do my homework. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, these people have done a ton of writing and uh, do tons of appearances and are involved in all sorts of things. So John Tenney was on uh, was involved in one or more episodes of Hellier. Okay. Now, now in the eighties, there was a well, uh, mid nineties, there was a group out of California and. They were kind of doing a similar uh, testing, but the technology back then kind of limited them. Uh, limited them? Wow. Uh, so um, they kind of fizzled out. And it took us to get to work through Arduino and Raspberry Pi and uh, different things along those lines so that we could gather this data. But they were more, they had some great theories. And I'm trying to remember the name of their group. And I cannot, I'm drawing a blank right now. So I apologize. Well, <laughs> at, at, at getting into my late 60s, I regularly uh, find myself uh, losing a memory. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of John Keel. He wrote the Mothman Prophecies. John yeah. Keel was a big Fortian. And it, I just think that that group of people and their writings and their influence and those who have been influenced by them are, are things that uh, people like you and me ought to check into. And I want to agree with you that um, I'm involved with a group called Skyhub. And what we're trying to do is uh, provide scientific instrumentation that automatically records uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon while excluding those things which are prosaic explanations like airplanes and satellites. So, the, that we're not talking about Skyhub tonight, but, but the, the underlying theme and reason continues to apply to your work as well as other paranormal work. The, the, the cost and complexity and capability of technology is transforming everything. So uh, we, what we can build a sensor package with a computer in it these mm -hmm. days that does things that uh, what could not be done 10 years ago and in addition to could not be done 10 years ago contain sensors that cost a thousand times less than 10 years ago. So this is going to transform all of these fields. And finally, we can do observational science of all types in these fields. Oh, agreed. And the other, and, you know, at the end of the day, let's say like it's, let's step back when I was saying when I was a kid and I was, took everything to black and white um, on all the books that I read and whatnot, you know, you're not supposed to do this, you can't do that, you know. And now if we can open those doors and let people write their own lines in, um, you know, going back to the consciousness thing, there's a lot of um, because we don't know. And if we can create, not only test and gather the data, then we can create things to help people, whether it be a psychic or, you know, um, a person looking to develop their uh, concentration skills or, um, or 
the paranormal investigator that wants to know exactly what's going on um, rather than uh, I got a yes or no, you know, type thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, you'd like shades of gray rather than just yes or no, if you can. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing is, um, if you begin seeing signals in these sensors, like you were talking earlier, uh, uh, in a different context, but if you begin seeing signals in these sensors and you can interact with the paranormal phenomena and see that changes occur in the sensor readings while you're doing these interactions, then you're, begin you're being handed on a silver platter uh, some sort of verification that there's consciousness and intelligence behind the, the signal. Right. Yeah, I mean, you really want, no matter what the platform, you know, what path you're looking at, communication is key. And, um, you know, it's a, a lecture that I did at a Culticon in Ontario. I, <laughs> I played a recording of this loud, demonic, horrible voice. And I said, now you're in a dark room. What's your first instinct? And the majority of people was like, run. And I said, but because the timing sequence has been changed, this is all it is. And it was just my voice saying, hi, I'm so glad to meet you. And uh, because of the perception of time and distortion of time. And that's the approach that we're looking at is every time we hear the term, you know, somebody says there's a growl. Going back to labels, without inducing fear and labeling, we want to know, we want a recording of it so we can check the timing sequence of it. Maybe there's something that we're not catching uh, or change the, the hertz of it. You know, we won't play it back at 48. We'll play it back at 33, just for example. And, you know, we, we want to know, you know, what these different, um, what is it? Not immediately label it. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, so we, we want to we want to go a little more into that. Uh, but Dave, it's your turn. Well, you know th that kind of goes down my road too. Why is it important to start to learn what is the root of the cause and effects to the paranormal phenomena that we are getting? You know, lights blinking or voices coming mm -hmm. over EVPs. Matt, what is the point of that? Well, you want to know what you're talking to. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, let's let's face it. We really don't. Um, we, you know, we're assuming we're talking to a ghost. We're assuming that, uh, you know, we're talking to a spirit, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, let's say, for example, uh, consciousness, and let's go back to that topic right there. Um, and I have it in the book where a paranormal investigator was so focused on hearing his name uh, that he projected his name into the ghost box, and it came back in his voice. Now, you know, so if you're doing a paranormal investigation and you're trying to contact the ghost, and I'm using the quotation marks in the air like everybody can see me, <clears throat> the um, uh, and you are trying to, you know, is this, you know, you, you find out, okay, there was a Mary that passed away there. There was a John that passed away there. So you're like, is this Mary? And you're really hoping this is Mary. Whatever is there on a consciousness on that wavelength, that frequency that's being transmitted by you, maybe picking up on that and responding, saying, yes, this is Mary. So there's those possibilities. Ultimately, it's communication. You got to know exactly who, what you're talking to. Is this an interdimensional frequencies, alien, you know, which I think is all connected personally, but, you know, that's a different story. But um, uh, we get wrapped up into the labels so much that we want to call everything and a deity, something we can relate to, unfortunately. That's what most people do out of fear. Okay, so... So with that, that we are trying to find the answers, we're trying to find whom or what we are talking to, does that go beyond ghosts and maybe that there is another spectrum to this of, of other timelines that are running simultaneously as ours here on Earth? Well, you know, 
practitioners in general and cultists uh, don't believe that because most of what we deal with is not on this plane. So once again, we don't know what the formula is on the other planes and on the other side of the veil, whatever you know your definition is. So with that being said, we often say, and jokingly, time doesn't exist because it's a linear measurement based off of the physical plane. And since we don't know what the other realms equation is for time, it's highly possible. Bob, what's your thoughts? Um, yeah, I'm really interested in delving into uh, and providing kind of much more detail, if we can, on the how you're measuring or, or, or perceiving uh, this uh, modification of the flow of time uh, in and around these experiences. How are you measuring this? Or, or, or are you planning on measuring? Go into this in more detail, because this seems difficult, and it'd be of uh, great interest to me, and I'm sure a lot of people listening. Well, right now, all we've got is a DT meter to build on, um, and we're going to be continually doing tests using that so that we can build on it. Uh, actually, sitting right next to the front door is a DT meter and a uh, new Raspberry Pi, uh, because one of the developers is going to be taking the data and seeing what he can do to change that. We're also, um, uh, <clears throat> we want to utilize, uh, because everything is frequency based, and as time can be, let's say like if the same frequency is sent out, but using, um, one's using rubidium timing and one's using a different form of timing, um, you know, they're going to hit the point at different times and be utilized in different ways. So uh, we're actually setting up a sensor array, but using piezoelectric, so it generates voltage based on the amount of pressure, uh, because each um, piezoelectric disc can produce its own voltage. So we can take that voltage and translate it into hertz, you know, and go into the, um, also go into the Raspberry Pi, but that's kind of down the road. Uh, we have it everything built, but he wants to work with the DT meter more in depth. Okay, T tell me what DT stands for. Freak, you know, uh, distortion time. Oh, time okay, distortion. okay, I got it now. Okay. It's not I got it. No, I, no, I get it. So I yeah. really do get it. So you're taking high precision clocks mm -hmm. like a like a rubidium or cesium or or uh, but on so depending on depending on your, what you need for time mm. resolution, you could even use the Raspberry Pi uh, to have network time protocol if you're internet connected and get down well under a millisecond. But if you've got the rubidium and cesium clocks, now you're down around nanoseconds. So right. do, you believe, do you believe you actually... Do you believe you actually need nanoseconds or is the frequency content of the interaction... Uh, uh, really much lower than that, so you could get away with a less expensive clock. I think it's, uh, you know, the rubidium concept, and I was just using it as an example, is more on the extreme side, but, um, you know, we won't need, you know, on the more sensitive, it's more of the, you know, if we're just constantly just getting zero and nothing, we'll start going more and more sensitive, but it, we, we need to know, even if it's <laughs> to the millionth, we need to know why and what that degree of change is happening. Uh, it's not, we're going to say, you know, I'm not one of these type of people when the test fails, I'm like, huh? well, that's not going to work. I, the, uh, I mentioned on break, uh, there was a device that kind of lit me up. Uh, I nicknamed it the Paradox. So the concept of behind piezoelectric is compressed crystals, and as they're uh, on the mechanical side, you know, they create voltage. So uh, what I did is I took uh, quartz crystals at varied thicknesses and applied 500,000 volts to create uh, the voltage effect. So they were arcing like um, spark plugs, I guess you could say. But they were contained in one container, and 
what happens is they're, of course, they're firing off at different times because they're different thicknesses. So I nicknamed it the paradox because when crystals are doing that, they're creating their own timing sequence. So you have different times at a different, singular location. And my theory was is to create a metronome, you know, so that whatever frequency something is transmitting, they can connect. And um, it didn't work, but the theory was there. So I'll, literally, I. It's not that I give up. It's just that I need to change the approach. Okay, so the the, the one approach we we really need to interact away from the radio mm -hmm. show, so that we can, so me and you and your engineers and <laughs> and scientists can get together. Yes. Yeah, so one way to really do this that would allow you to use these clocks is to impose on the time sequence that you're getting from your uh, your recording mechanism mm -hmm. uh, ticks from the clock so that you can now register an extremely accurate clock on top of the signal of interest. Yeah, this is this is very cool. Dave, before we get too down the uh, the physics rabbit hole, why don't you take a question? Yeah, not a problem, Matt. With the gear that you are using right now and the gear you are testing with, is it really an important uh, manifestation of the technology and the and the and the science around it to try and create this gear that can take that communication to an entirely new level? And we got about two minutes before we got to go to break. Uh, yes, that's the ultimate goal: is to take the communication part of it to a completely different level. Because through proper communication, we can learn and. Um, uh, about not only about ourselves, but about whoever or whatever we're talking to. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, yeah, it's, if we can get enough data to come up with a proper communication method um, or develop a methodology based on this, um, then you're no longer running around in the dark as a paranormal investigator going, what's that, what's that? Uh, not to quote South Park, um, but uh, you're, you know it doesn't matter if you're looking up at the skies or whatnot. You have a means to communicate, and the key point is it comes from you. Is what we're learning. Yeah. So, so I gotta tell you, say let's 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 pick on somebody. Let's let's pick on Zach Bagans and Ghost Adventures. Uh. They have a but they have a <clears throat> bunch of sensors. Mm -hmm. uh, they collect some something, but it's not really usable data. But they mm -hmm. collect something. They get an indication, but right. the indication then is an incomplete indication that their voiced uh, request, interaction, words, etc., are being received and acted upon. But that's an inadequate, like microphone, for you to talk to the paranormal phenomenon uh, so that you could then turn around and measure the interaction you're actually having with the paranormal phenomenon so that you can prove through some kind of scientific application that you, the, the, the interactions are mathematically and statistically correlated to the extent that you get yourself a, you know, a mini sigma event that it's non-random, those kinds of things. I mean, you, they, they get an indication, but the only thing they're doing is providing entertainment That's right. to those who are watching the show. This is not doing scientific observation. Gentlemen, we are going to take that answer when we get back. Science Bob and Friends with special guest Matt Lay from the Madutu Effect continues in Hour 2 on Spaced Out Radio right after this. Sorry about that, guys. We'll have to take that answer right when we get back. No, you're good. I'm, uh -huh. you, you guys talk away to the YouTube crowd, and I'm going to just uh, run uh, the dogs outside, all right? I'll be right back. Yeah, I, I'm going to go grab a cup of coffee. That's what I need. <laughs>
I'm all stocked up on my coffee now. Oh. Yeah, Allison posted, uh, would love to hear uh, about other theories and ideas. You can also hit us up on the Facebook page, the Medutu, uh, just facebook.com, House Medutu. Uh, you can send us a message. We're open to any theories. Because unfortunately, I've made the mistake in the past of dismissing theories, and it turned out they were pretty much sort of spot on. Boys, we got 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Well, I'm loaded up on coffee. Good. Uh, your beard. <laughs> your beard is looking good. That's the main yeah. thing. Yeah, I just got to get out of this damn cord. <laughs> How much snow you got there? It wasn't too bad. Mostly ice. But yeah, that's what I don't like is the ice. God. Yeah. Okay, now I think I'm untangled. <laughs> rock and roll, man. Rock and roll. You know, I was just telling everybody we're open to any and all theories because all too often in the past I've dismissed them, and that's my lesson learned. that there are not enough people with science backgrounds that'll interact and talk with people so that you can just get shit done. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty. Hey, Bob, how's your, how's your snowblower doing in Alabama? What's up, brother? How, how's your snowblower doing in Alabama? It's absolutely inert. So uh, tomorrow I'm going to put... Uh, Stabilized gasoline in it and crank it to make sure it's still running. Okay, hold and on, then I'm going to change on, the oil. I'm oh. going to change the oil. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. We thank every veteran out there who is tuning in you are loved you are wonderful and thank you for your freedom we welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around north america and digitally on talk stream live and revolution radio along with kpnl digital radio don't forget you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio do old davy the favor hit that subscribe button the Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Prendical. Prendical is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Science Bob and Friends. Dr. Bob McGuire is my co-host and our special guest tonight from the Medutu Effect. We have Matt Lay. Science Bob, how you doing, man? I'm doing super duper now that I got a cup of coffee. Well, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Now, right before the break, you had asked a question to Matt regarding uh, television shows and the way things are done there comparatively to what is really going on in the paranormal. Matt, do you want to continue with your answer? It's more with the television shows. Once again, it's for entertainment. But um, And to go back to what Science Bob was saying about the um, collecting the voice phenomenon and things like that. So 
yeah, we've caught voice phenomenon before, um, you know, EVPs and uh, disembodied voices and, you know, things like that. But you still don't know the how did it show up as an EVP? How did it get impressed into a digital recorder? How, you know, well, how in the world did this microphone with this range catch an EVP? What range specifically was it supposed to be recording in? You know, was that voice coming across? That's the questions that we're asking. And, um, you know, once again, it, unfortunately, paranormal investigation has turned into the check engine light. You know, it, yes, it came on. Yes, there's something there. Exactly. But I'm not really going to address it because I got 27 other ones showing up in my system. I just got an indicator and there's something going on in my car. So, um, you know, so <laughs> that's unfortunately that is the real world that is developed out of it because we've come to accept, you know, the yes, no, got an EVP, there's a shadow. Um, let's say caught a shadow. Let's ask the question because immediately you see, I've got a picture. It's on my page of some of an experiment that we did. And um, it's about four foot tall. So what's the first thing everybody says? Mm -hmm. It's a child. Well, the perceptions of uh, the way our eyesight and that frequency range that could not very well be a child. It could be just literally an energy mass. It could be this. It could be that. It's a million different things it could be. Once again, it becomes a check engine light, and we just see something and immediately going, yep, there's something there. Well, yeah, so this, this brings me to uh, kind of a, a really serious interest of mine of late. So... Um, Recently, there was this uh, scientific paper written, which is talking about consciousness is, uh, at least in part, an, in, an information-rich electromagnetic field interaction from our brain to whatever the consciousness field is. And that there's this actual scientific theory. The nice thing about it is that this scientific theory uh, is rich enough uh, and that it's based on information. In other words, the zeros and ones of uh, bits of information and provides you with an experimental tableau. Uh, so you can, you can figure out how to do actual experiments on whether or not this consciousness theory is real and accurate or needs modification or whatever. So it's just really, really interesting that we can do this kind of thing now that we just couldn't do before. And not only that, there are multiple people like John Joe McFadden, who is the person that wrote this, the see me feel theory of consciousness paper, uh, and do, do some actual work rather than just providing, as you say, a check engine light for people's entertainments on the travel channel. Mm -hmm. I think it's time. Well, it's funny you should mention that, and if it's okay, and I don't mean to uh, step on you, Dave, but is there, uh, can I discuss, you, go right ahead. Day, there you know, it's, this is a, this is a conversation, dude, <laughs> go ahead. I, I get excited about this one, um, so, uh, several years ago, we tried it, and we failed, and we tried it again, and we failed, and so this time we were actually successful. What we did is it took something as simple as an oscilloscope, and this goes back to the mid '90s. I tried an experiment. Remember those big giant oscilloscopes? You know, now oh, yeah. they're about you know to sit in your hand. Um, but we took uh, the same with the practitioners in the circle, and we lined the whole outside with copper, very thin, 24 gauge copper wire. And because we, the thinner the wire, the higher the frequencies, uh, you have more of a frequency range interaction. And we ran it completely all the way around the circle and then tied it to the oscilloscope and, of course, had an isolated ground uh, for it. The previous ones failed because for some reason or another, either the wire would pop or um, uh, it looked like on one of the most recent previous ones, it looked like it literally was burnt. 
but this time uh, it worked out very well, and we're actually catching um, exact frequency ranges. And um, whereas before, let's say like before the ritual, we check, uh, we monitor. After the ritual, we check, we monitor. During, it was interesting. You got four people in the quarters, and uh, this is not focused on any type of deity or anything. This is just strictly an energy. And uh, once after their four quarters were called, you see an actual pattern of people syncing up. So it goes from 7 hertz to 41 hertz. Now, the reason this is exciting, because the 41 hertz is in the gamma range and uh, of the brain. So the question now becomes, are they transmitting at that uh, frequency? Now, let's take that a step further. You know, we're talking about consciousness. Uh, when you're doing, uh, there's a, a story I mentioned on the last show on the round table where I saw one of the triangle UFOs, and this is in Mobile, and um, I was focusing on the, uh, uh, the triangle, and there's a practice called calling down the moon where you form your hands in a triangle and you focus your thoughts and everything. So was I at that age transmitting at 41 hertz? So now we're going to be questioning that. Uh, we want to know how... Um, when we go into these different environments, when we're actually making communication, what is the frequency that the brain is emitting? But going back to what you said, when as a paranormal investigator, the first thing you should do is check to see if anything is interrupting those brainwave transmissions and, you know, the high EMF fields and different things like that. So, you know, all those things are connected, but we want to know the whys and hows and... Uh, that's why we actually have a oscillator transmitter. Uh, one of the developers uh, wants to do a, what you call the, the sugar pill test and have one oscillator that doesn't really oscillate and one it does and goes from 7 to 41 back and forth with a three-second timeout period and, um, and see if uh, people that do heavy meditations and channeling and whatnot see an enhanced, um, uh, a more of an, uh, an experience, uh, I guess you'll say. So now we go to this, to the paranormal field. Practitioners, a group of practitioners go in, they're all in the same mindset, they're excited, they're scared, everything, but they suddenly sync up. Are they doing the same identical thing? So that's what we're questioning. Oh, that's excellent. So, so now, see, as an information theorist and scientist, and communications engineer and scientist, um, to me, see, I would try to figure out uh, is is there what is the mutual information between those two signals because that gives you a quantitative, not just a qualitative way of measuring whether they share information content. So, I I, I love that I love that you're doing that from whatever approach you're taking, whether it's intuitive or whether you have somebody input it, because it says to me, you're trying to measure whether or not there's an information interaction, which is the thing we should be doing. Right. I mean, it's kind of like uh, your upload uh, frequencies and your download frequencies. They're not on the same frequencies. You know, it doesn't matter if you're some of the dish or whatnot, you know, uh, from anywhere from your internet. So, if it's, you know, say for the internet, your upload speed, your uploads are between 5 and 42 uh, megahertz and your downloads are whatever the provider provides. But the, uh, the point is, is that let's say like the 7 hertz, because it went from 7 to 14 to 41. Those are the three markers that we have. So let's just shoot it out there as... Is the seven the download and the forty one the upload? Yeah, let's you know in layman terms, you know, just like what you said, you're building that br uh, communication bridge gap. Hmm. Okay, so if you're building that communication bridge gap, what are the results you were looking for? Well, the results we're ultimately looking for is the key word in there was communication. But the more we can communicate, the more we can learn and. So let's say, 
for example, we do build that bridge gap uh, between uh, from the practitioner side to the paranormal investigator going out. The uh, even you know with the cryptids, the UFO researchers, all these different things, all the way down to the, um, the multi-dimensional. Because um, personally, and this is just me personally, uh, I feel like they're all connected. And um, so with that being said, now you're no longer reaching for your camera to take a snapshot and to show everybody the big fish. You're now communicating. And that would be gold to me if we're now communicating instead of chasing after speculation and also with the self-development that could evolve out of this. This is gr this is great, Matt. So so we had we had uh, Brandon Fugel on from Skinwalker Ranch uh, two months ago, mm -hmm. and they're doing all sorts of collection of signals of all types, but they're not doing exactly what you and I are talking about, which is trying to measure whether or not things are in communication by looking for these kinds of correlations that can be quantitatively measured. So uh, it because uh, and and just just another thing you said earlier that really stirred me up uh, is that uh, there's all this kind of hypothesis by the people that are in this show on the History Channel about Skinwalker Ranch that the entire Uinta Basin and the place that a lot of the interactions happen around the ranch uh, happen like there was a transmitter dish there. So that it has this dish-like shape. And then they did all these experiments that showed that a lot of the weird stuff that they saw was like at the focus of the dish that's, that, that is naturally arises from the Uinta Basin. These, this is just beg for the mm -hmm. looking of an information-bearing signal of, from all of the things they observe so that you could establish communication. So let's suppose an alien or a robot or whatever is buried underneath the ground and it's desperate to communicate. Mm -hmm. And on occasion it gets angry because you're too stupid to listen. <laughs> uh, and it reaches out and burns people with radiation or does other things trying to get your attention. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, there's too many good experiments that can be done uh, in and around these kinds of places. If we take this, I want to find out, are they attempting to communicate kind of approach? Well, it's funny you should mention that because that was also at my uh, lecture. Um, I asked, um, you know, if, you know, you always hear the tale, you know, something touched me and it burned, you know, and it, it must be a demon right away. You know, immediately the label comes out. But if a person is operating in a different frequency, whether it's in this realm, you know, outside of this realm, and they're trying to communicate with you, it could have been a simple touch. So, you know, of course, it's going to come across as a burn um, or a scratch, you know, type concept. So immediately, instead of looking at it as something evil or whatnot, because, it, you know, of course, we're going to be a little aggravated. I'm cleaning my words up that it's uh, it hurts you. But right away, the question needs to be happening of how can I communicate better? you know, to eliminate this from happening to me. And maybe they're just trying to give a, a simple nudge of, you know, the, this nice hello, but because of that frequency variation, uh, it's going to, you know, what if they're operating at a very high frequency? That's almost like a microwave burn. Oh, yes. Uh, you, you, you look, and people, look, you can get a microwave burn. How do you think microwave cooks your food? Yeah, I mean, exactly. what it does is rattle around the water molecules inside whatever it is you're trying to heat. You can definitely get a burn from microwaves. But unfortunately, because of, uh, but see, once again, that's a, a theory. I don't have a proof of that, you know. But it's it, we have to chase after these doors and open them up. And, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, it's like when you come into the building here, uh, it's a 
It's a building we bought in Milestone, which, by the way, has an amazing natural uh, magnetic center to it. Uh, you can measure it with a tri-field. Um, it's, it's, it, I'm ex absolutely ecstatic over it. But anyway, when you come into the building, um, you know, it's, just, it's literally no different uh, with the... Um, yeah, I completely lost. It, it must be an age thing because I got excited about the magnetic field in the center. <laughs> no kidding. I, I, I was excited too when I saw Travis and Brandon and Eric Bard and all those guys talking about this focal point for the dish that's made out of the Uinta Basin. Man, I just was like, oh my goodness, I can't wait to talk to this guy. But yeah, we're... Um... We're, we're, I mean, when I say we're we dig into old information, though, you know, I've had some. I have a library here. It's open for anybody to come into the building. They can sit down and go to these old books, and it's like, you know, I have all of John Dee's transcripts. Um, and for those that don't know, John Dee was science advisor to Queen Elizabeth the first, but he was also the founder of magical systems, and uh, he, you know, is a well versed individual, but. There's also these books on, and it's really interesting. You were reading from like the 14th century, and they describe circles in the magical theorem. But if you read between the lines, you'll actually see an actual formula being developed of almost a sphere. Um, it's kind of like in the occult, the you don't look at the dot, the you look at the line, because your your perception is not looking at it in its proper mannerism. So. Um, because you're too busy looking at the line straight on. But, you know, some of these old books that are, get dismissed, and I keep looking over my shoulder, it's, um, there's, some of the information in them ties to today and what we're finding. So mixing that with what we can learn is, for us, gold. No kidding. So, uh, t well, tell us about your place there here in Saskatchewan, right? But tell us, tell us about the the site, the place, uh, what kind of what kind of uh, place you're in, in what kind of ever building you're in. Tell us about it. Well, the, the building is 113 years old. Um, it was originally a bank. It's always been a bank. It has two vaults in there. So, you know, there you go, Dave. You got uh, your sleep deprivation, uh, sensory deprivation room, if you want it. Oh, I, I uh, want that. I want that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <coughs> what we did is we bought it and completely gutted it and remodeled it. We live upstairs. Uh, the main area, the main floor is um, open for, like, work groups and lectures, and it doesn't matter. Just recently, a person drove all the way from Regina, came here, and just said they wanted to meditate, which is what I enjoy. Um, they just wanted a quiet, safe place to meditate. Um, at the main floor is like 900, 900 950 square feet. Um, it's just open area. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Science Bob, that picture I sent you uh, showing off my beard, the uh, prints like that are all the way around the room so that people ask questions. Uh, and it's anywhere from the original alchemical charts to uh, Pythagoras, uh, Tree of Life. Um, you know, I'm looking around the room now. Uh, but uh, these were all old occult formulas that are applicable to today's life. And so... Um, the building is all uh, Tyndall stone outside, which is mined, uh, which is a limestone. Um, uh, it's, and and, uh, and there's the gumbo land here in Saskatchewan. It's only shifted an inch and a quarter in 113 years. Downstairs in the basement, uh, we have a, a store down there, and that's also where we make, uh, Allison makes resin products, and I make candles and incense. Um, so, you know, as much as I like technology, I also like some of the traditional things. Um, and uh, because there's, there's also a science approach to those as well. That's terrific. So I thought you were in Regina, but it sounds like you're not. Where are, where are you? 
We're about 25 minutes south of Regina. It's called Milestone. Okay, great. So, Bob, so you just got to ask him to wave, man. You just got to ask him to wave. This is great. So, again, you know, every time people like you talk to somebody like me, I think of something I've read that you might be interested in. Uh, so, uh, Alan Greenfield has, has regularly appeared on uh, Dave's show, and he wrote this book, which I find fascinating, uh, because uh, he's written down this kind of formulaic process you go through to try to analyze interactions you're having with the paranormal. And it's called the secret cipher of the euphonauts. And mm. it's just this fascinating book. Uh, and just if you ever want to see an application of Greenfield's uh, secret cipher of the euphonauts, I'm going to go back again to Hellier, uh, which is uh, the, which along with uh, 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 John Tenney, Alan Greenfield interacted with them, and they applied the secret cipher of the euphonauts in order to build, basically... Science Bob, I'm going to get you to cut right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. More of Science Bob in France with special guest Matt Lay talking paranormal all night long on Spaced Out Radio. Sorry, Science Bob. Oh, sorry, Dave. I got carried away. I know. I did the same thing. <laughs> we all get so damn excited and these stupid commercial breaks come up. You got to pay the bills, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. By the way, to everybody listening in, I'm hoping to have the the new SOR vault up tomorrow. I don't know if it'll be on the website but the Facebook page will be there. Uh, we're going to link the Facebook page to the website so you could go browse, peruse, and order your stuff right there. Uh, I'll set up a, an email for that as well just in case you're not a user of Facebook, but you're like, hey, dude, I want one of those shirts. Well, we can still get it for you. We can still get it for you, and uh, that'll be easy for us to do. Um so I'm hoping to have them up tomorrow. And, uh, yes, Dirty Filth, this is a Canuck shirt that I am wearing tonight. It is. I'm supporting. I'm supporting. I'm representing. You know, one day, one day before. I'm at that age now, guys, where literally I am saying, you know, I hope they win before my life ends. I've officially reached that that point in my life. Not gonna lie. What can I say? <laughs> you, you, you. Well, you want me to agree with you? You already know I do. <laughs> yeah. It's just weird. It's just weird. I never thought I would hit that point. Well, as you're getting older and wiser, what can I say? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we've got a few minutes here, but yeah. Uh, thank you to Max Ritchie and Brett Lewis for the super chats tonight. And oh, yeah, I forgot. Yes. And, uh, John Hudson believes that you are doing fantastic work, Matt. Fantastic work. Nice. Yeah. We're, uh, we're going to keep expanding we're not going to stop <laughs> until the, the pitch port, the pitch ports and torches show up. I can't wait to get the new shirts out. I really can't. I'm just pumped up about it. Hey, Science Bob with a super chat. Science Bob with a super chat. Thank you, Science Bob. You didn't have to do that. Of course I did, brother. Oh. Hey, Kev. I mean, look, everybody knows that... Uh... That if I didn't pay my way on, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't get here. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. Oh, yeah, that is the biggest crock of shit I've heard you ever say. <laughs> oh. You have a lot of fun here, Matt. Oh, yeah. I agree. I'm loving this. 
I told you Matt was okay. I mean, you could just tell by the beard right off the bat. As soon as I heard his accent, I knew it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Alice is down here. But yeah. You should get him drunk. It's even better. Oh, yeah. When I get drunk, I turn into the stereotypical Forrest Gump. Or, or oh, yeah. you just read you the Goetia and Forrest Gump. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I completely agree with. <laughs> if, if I get my Rebel Yell whiskey and get that going, I get to be a real redneck. Oh, that that means I'm going to have to go buy some Fireball tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I like Fireball, but Rebel Yale's cheaper. <laughs> yeah, I got uh, a drunk one night and decided to do Forrest Gump while I'm reading some of these old grimoires uh, from, like, the 14th century. That was quite comical. We got one minute, boys. One minute. Fireball and snow. You make a nice snowball and you throw Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Fireball and snow. Or, uh, and Kimberly reminds me, fireball and cream soda. That is fantastic. Oh, yeah. That is fantastic. The problem with fireballs is too much like candy. Yeah. yeah. But I got a sweet tooth, so. <laughs> Works for me, man. Works for me. I like my Rebel Yell neat. <laughs> All right, so boys. You and Allison get on perfect. All right, boys, we got 20 seconds here. Thank you to Science Bob, Max, and Brett once again for the super chats. Thank you to everybody who has given us a thumbs up or down so far. And uh, hit that subscribe button if you're new. The SOR Vault will be updated hopefully by tomorrow for new swag. Here we go. We pass the halfway point of Space Down Radio tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dave Scott, sitting here at SOR headquarters, surrounded by a lot of snow. A lot of It's way too early. But nonetheless, the show must go on, and we want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button, our website, is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, at Spaced Out Radio Show. Big shout-out to one of our YouTube listeners tonight, Kev Clark. Happy birthday to you. I hope you have an amazing birthday, and everything goes awesome for you. There we go. Science Bob and Friends continues right here on spaced out radio we do this once a month where we kind of bypass the woo to get to the who what where when why and definitely how science bob is joined by our special guest matt lay from the modutu effect out of the beautiful province of saskatchewan if you wave to him he'll be able to see you because it's nice and flat there gentlemen welcome back oh my goodness we're having fun right matt Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so before, before we left, I was just so enthusiastic, I ran into the break. And I just wanted to suggest that you check out the, the uh, uh, work of Alan Greenfield, especially his secret cipher, the UFO knots. Uh, I just think it's interesting. Okay, yeah, I actually I had to write that. You created me a good list here, I want to say, you know, because I, I love reading up and coming up with new theories and building on others. Well, these guys around the Hellier uh, episodes, which are... Oh, where'd he go? Oh, there we go. Now we got you back, Science Bob. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's your turn. Okay. Well, let, let's continue on with with uh, the this, the effects of what we are trying to prove. Matt, 
a lot of people, and, and I may sound very naive about this, Matt, but when I think of the paranormal, I think of trying to solve life's greatest mystery, which is, is there life after death? Now, the, the spiritual side of me says, yes, there is, and yes, it continues, and, and yes, it is a, a wonderful thing that uh, the soul moves on from the human body and after we are done on this planet, but there's still that fear of what if for a lot of people. And yet we have all of this paranormal evidence, whether it's residual energy or current energy or however you want to look at it, that is out there that is causing some sort of paranormal phenomena to happen. What is the ultimate goal? Is it to prove a life after death? Or is it just the communication to try and figure out what it is? I'm very curious about this. It's more along the lines of the communication and, you know, finding out the details. But to go back to your question, you know, and to also state what I was stating earlier, I've got uh, three shelves of books from different cultures all over the world uh, that speak of nothing more than uh, it continues to go on, uh, but not in the aspect of, you know, getting up in the morning, putting on your shoes type thing, uh, is that it goes on, uh, it doesn't matter if it's from, I'm glancing over at the Icelandic text, and, you know, it becomes a, a reconnection to the cosmos, a uh, reconnection to, you know, because, and everything that we're detecting, and Science Bob can uh, back this up, uh, we're, we're chasing frequencies, Frequencies, by definition, can be also translated into energy. So it doesn't matter if you're catching a voice, you're seeing a presence or whatnot, you're chasing different forms of energy, a.k.a. frequencies. So um, with that being said, you're chasing frequencies. What's the better way to chase it than to communicate? So looping all the way back around, we're key word here is we want to communicate Okay, so with the communication part, Matt, what are you hoping to communicate with? The dead? <laughs> God? As, as the majority of people on this planet know it? Like, what are you looking for? Well, that's the thing is I don't think any of us know what we're looking for. Um, you know, from paranormal investigations, we're assuming. There's a lot of assumptions um let's go back to the tv show that i mentioned earlier i i know i'm treating it like a voldemort type thing but um you know the name that shall not be mentioned but the you know it's a the thing is is that when we are seeking communication we're if you have an open communication like what we're doing right now i've learned quite a few things i've written down multiple notes through open communications, things I didn't know. Well, I can make a lot of assumptions. You know, Science Bob, no offense, but I creeped on you. I had to troll you to find out, you know, who exactly was going to be on here. So, but just doing that, you can reach assumptions. Having open communications, we're finding out the facts. So it's... That's the key point. We've got to have an open communication to whatever is out there. We know that there's something out there. It's been written down for centuries that there's something out there. And TV shows have sensationalized it. But we need to know what we're chasing. You know, that you can label it whatever you want. At the end of the day, still it's a label. It's not exactly, you know, it would, what you're chasing. Science Bob, I want to ask you in regards to this, should we be playing with the afterlife to, to try and find the scientific understanding of what goes on after we die? I, I, I say absolutely yes, because until we understand what is consciousness, how is it physically enabled and carried, we won't be able to answer lots of questions. And just this, uh, Matt was talking about frequencies and energy being connected. So that leads right to frequency and energy are known to be connected. 
since the beginning of the 20th century when Planck and Einstein began quantum mechanics and shows that frequency and energy are exactly equ uh, uh, related through a simple formula mm -hmm. uh, that uses Planck's constant as uh, the proportionality constant. So that, that's all mathematical gobbledygook for, yeah, you're right. But, it, <laughs> but and, and the, the recent the recent work that I cited earlier on consciousness also uh, lends credence to this because it's an electromagnetic, electromagnetic field theory for how consciousness works. And in addition to this, the thing that's driven everybody crazy since quantum mechanics came around is the observer impacts the outcome of physics experiments just by looking. Mm -hmm. So there's consciousness going on and interacting with these physical uh, experiments. And until we understand the nature of that interaction, we cannot improve our understanding and utilization of the physical world. And nothing has changed us more than quantum mechanics and quantum field theory since the beginning of the 20th century. We're all sitting here using the Internet. We're all communicating using computer-based entities, and not one of them would work if we did not have a, a, at least a decent understanding of quantum mechanics. So there you go. That's my soapbox. <laughs> well, let's look at it from a very simplistic term. Um, you know, in the center of the building, I have an incense burner that I made, and, you know, I make incense, I burn incense, and I do my little dedication. That's just me as an individual. So that sounds very primitive, you know, based on what we're talking about. But now if you look at the science behind it, smoke has been like a bunch of research has been done all over the world over how uh, static particles are carried through the particles of the smoke because they're basically small dust particles. And you're mostly looking at it, how it affects electronics and how it can act as a conductor. So if my thought patterns are just that, frequencies, and I am emitting, and I'm emitting into a smoke particle, then I am basically carrying that energy into whatever, you know, your definition may be. You know, different paths have, may have different definitions. So to say that it's just someone sitting there burning some incense and you know, praying or meditating or whatever, that is a concept of you transferring energy and that smoke is acting as a con uh, conductor. So a simple action can actually have more of a defined purpose. One of the researchers that we have uh, that's helping us, he specializes in... Um, uh, uh, it's mostly on not the string theory, but the newest one. And science, Bob, you're going to have to help me out with this one. Um, uh, he does a lot of research on wormhole theories and string theories, but the newest one with the quantum. Um, Juan Malacena? Uh, no, the. Oh, I know if he said it, I'd remember it. The, uh, uh, where the, the two particles go out. And the, either way, at one point in time, they're going to intersect, but the possibilities of them intersecting again is um, minimal. But the intersection points are what's the important part, and they're looking at that as it's, you know, for time. So when he's doing the research for the uh, time distortion device, that's what he's basing all of his research on, is those theories. So we're not just, you know, a bunch of... Uh, chanting, researching individuals, we're actually looking at the science behind it. No, that's, and that's exactly what we should do. Dave is right to ask the question, and mm -hmm. you're right to make that statement. And what's happened heretofore is most scientists wouldn't even consider looking at what science can say about the these paranormal phenomena, and it's time, because we need it. I agree, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I walk two different paths. You know, I'm like I said, I'm a bit of a traditionalist, but you know, you know, I, 
but as far as that goes, I want to know the why is it how's it working. And it's actually, it's not just me. It's you know those practitioners that were in the circle. They're the same thought you know thought pattern. They want to know the why's. Why has this worked for centuries? You know, um, they don't want to just do the because it has. You know, <laughs> that normal response you always hear. You know, uh, the the mama response because I said so. You know, you know that that's. Nobody wants that anymore. We want to know the whys. Totally agree. Yeah, my, my, my personal interest, I'll just tell you. So I've had uh, my UFO experiences, et cetera, here are known. <clears throat> Less well known are my paranormal experiences. So my wife and I went with two friends to Avenel House in Bedford, Virginia. And while we were in there, we were, because it's supposed to be haunted. So we were in a room. And this is the last room we were going into the night. We we heard uh, the the what we thought was the other people uh, in the hall out talking and walking. And so we were a little bit grumpy because they interfered with our session to, because we were trying to hear and capture EVP. And of course, all that noise would interfere with it. So that was our last session. We went downstairs and we grumped at them about making noise. Then we we've been down here for 20 minutes. So we heard voices, we heard walking, et cetera, and got it on a tape recorder, and it was not the other people. It was whatever we came to that house for. And since that time, I've wanted to figure out that was a signal that could have been recorded and analyzed, and I need to, I need to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a bunch of opportunities where we record audio and then, you know, it's literally over the top compelling that you caught this audio and but it, it drives me absolutely batty when you can't explain it and oh I, I totally agree dave's had all sorts of woo experiences right dave i i am a woo master i have <laughs> i i officially have my woo master belt that's yeah, a, he's actually got, he's got i'm gonna be honest with you that's something i now need for the studio is a championship belt that says Woo Master. Ooh, I agree. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. I, I'm going to have to put some thought into that. Uh, you know, I I have both of you here, and, and from a scientific standpoint, because I am the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to science on this show, the communication aspect of trying to figure out where these voices are coming from, where this energy is coming from. How do we go about trying to to record that for, you know, answers to what we are doing? So I have I can give you one input and Matt I'm certain can give you a different input, but let me give you one input. So so let's suppose I have these sensors that can record these electronic voice phenomena. And you take one of Matt's fancy clocks and you impose a time signal on the recording along with the audio. So from this time registration on the audio, I can tell the time of arrival of the voice signal on each and every one of the recorders. So as soon as I have that, I can give you the direction and the distance from where the voice phenomenon occurred. So it, I, it's like a little radar. I can give you a radar location and distance for where the thing was em, emanated from. So this is the kind of science that's not being done by most paranormal people. And it's the time difference of arrival trying to figure out where did that come from that would really be helpful because if we know where it came from, we could correlate it with other signals, electromagnetic, ultraviolet, whatever, microwave, whatever, that are also present there. And this is when you're getting due to really good science. And I'm sure Matt has a different perspective. Uh, actually, you're pretty much a, uh, spot on. The thing is, is that the recording devices that we use, the frequency range is based off of our hearing, um, current hearing. And there's a lot of experimentation going with infrasound right now, but that's 
Awesome. Um, you can go to your local grocery store and listen to the conversation on the next aisle. That doesn't still help you. Uh, you won't be able to see who that is. You won't be able to know where they actually are or anything. And I agree with Science Bob. This new device that we're, um, <laughs> I almost said his name. He asked me not to say his name on the air. Um, uh, but the, one of the gentlemen that's developing one of the Arduino uh, boards, and you'll love this, Science Bob, is to the sensor array, and I say it's an array, it's 10 sensors. And the idea behind it is, is once it starts picking up frequencies emitting, it will turn so that the array will actually point, not only point in that direction, but see if it can collect more data. So it's not a, a case, and the frequency range has been opened up on it. So um, each sensor is, one starts at five, uh, and they go all the way up to the megahertz. The concept here is that if we do start getting specific frequencies and we have an EVP to correlate to it, it's not only turning and following it, but it's also in sync with the DT meter. That's why the Raspberry Pi has to be developed better. Okay, so that, that and just, yes. So it, you can't believe how nearly, nearly identical uh, what your work is to what Skyhub is doing. We're using slightly more advanced sensors but Skyhub is trying to do the same thing for UAP that you're trying to do for other paranormal phenomena because the physics of communication is the same no matter the context. So you got to figure out a way to do the recording and analyzing the actual signals you're getting. And so it's the same work. So, again, technology has made this so easy. And for oh, Raspberry Pi, you can go to a company called Seed, and that's spelled S with three E's and a D, seed, and look at their Grove, G-R-O-V-E sensors. And they're like 20 or $25, and they're doing amazing sensors. And not only that, they've given you the appliance to attach these sensors and run it into the Raspberry Pi. So the ability to record all sorts of sensor data by paranormal or UFO or whatever people is just so great it is a crime and a sin not to do it <laughs> oh agreed you know i i look at all the new gadgets that come out in the paranormal field religiously and uh, it's just i have to give them props for creativity but it's just unfortunately i just bow my head and because i don't feel like it's gathering data it's once again you're looking for the check engine light yeah that. which is ridiculous we, we we completely agree gentlemen we only have about two and a half minutes here before we have to go to break at the top of the hour science bob and matt lay are our guests tonight on science bob and friends talking about science and the paranormal in your opinion matt as time runs down here what is the most impressive piece of evidence that you have that you, you have scientifically concluded that there is something really out there that we need to figure out Ooh, that's a that's a hard one to narrow down um on the break i mentioned and i'll make this really quick uh that a lot of times we get theories and yes i've chuckled at a few of them and I've, my lesson learned is never dismiss even the most off the wall theory and one of the ones, and I mentioned it earlier with the uh, four-foot figure, that theory was based off of um, heat. Heat is energy. Energy is frequency. And, you know, so I thought, well, maybe if I put some low-wattage uh, heat lamps, something as simple as that, on a board and set up a grid pattern. And uh, to me, that was one of the most compelling ones because I... Once again, I was dismissing their theory, but I was going to try it. And so we had the camera, had the floor, uh, had everything set up. And sure enough, we caught something moving toward it and kept walking away, moving toward it, walking away. Now, I noticed the key word in was something. We never collected enough data to tell you what that something was. So 
is that something that needed the energy in order to manifest because it was showing up as a cold spot in the floor. So to me, it's not only compelling, but anything is to me that's compelling drives more questions. Let me let me add quickly that FLIR is forward-looking infrared cameras for those in the audience who don't know what FLIR is. And when we get back, I got to tell you an interesting story about the FLIR. <laughs> I'm always look, up for a good story, definitely. Science Bob, we got 30 seconds left. You know, as someone who's more a UFO guy, how how you feeling about this? paranormal stuff 30 seconds well well i think i indicated earlier why i'm interested in all of this because it's all tangled up with consciousness and i'm into consciousness now you're the american grant cameron my friend the american <laughs> grant cameron and, and you're with right a phd in math <laughs> <laughs> it's all about numbers everything is it's all about the numbers isn't that true gentlemen i'm gonna get you guys to sit tight here because we are going to go to break at the top of the hour here. Science Bob with Bob McGuire, formerly of Virginia Tech University, now studying on his own, checking things out in the UFO world, the paranormal world, and he, we love it here because we bring him on once a month for Science Bob and Friends, and we continue on with our special guest, Matt Lay, from the Madutu Effect as well. We'll be back with more Science Bob and Friends right after this on Spaced Out Radio. All right, guys, we're clear. I'm just going to run my dogs outside. Okay, I'm going to get a refill on coffee, but real quick, uh, um, Bob, have you read... Um, any of David Morehouse books on remote viewing? I, I have not. So uh, I'm a mindful meditator, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm friends with uh, Tracy Dolan, and she's a remote viewer that mm -hmm. was trained by the Monroe Institute. So I am interested in that. If you like it, I'll go read it. I would highly recommend it. Uh, just look up the, it's the user's manual for remote viewing, and it's a way to... It's an approach. I love the explanations that he has in it. It's more along uh, on the, the speed of the analytics of why it's working. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah, I look forward to that. And I'm going to real quick grab my refuel, and I'll be right back. <laughs> Just for the audience, the remote viewing complete user's manual for coordinate remote viewing is nine dollars on Amazon. Okay. I just gotta get my beard untangled from the cord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine's gotten long. So I started this when we went into quarantine, and I swear that I'm not gonna cut it until quarantine and COVID is over. So it might be down to my knees by then. Well, my daughter says she wants Dumbledore, so that's why I've been growing my beard. Cause there you go. All the. Uh, Everybody nicknames me the wizard around here, so um, why not? <laughs> As a matter of fact, during uh, uh, Halloween, some kids you know, answered the door and did the whole trick-or-treat thing, and they said, uh, oh, you're dressed as Dumbledore. And I'm like, no, I'm not even wearing a costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
Yes, I have a lab coat and a cape with the S on it and an Einstein wig and mustache. Uh, so that's my get up when I'm playing Science Bob, uh, as, uh, and that's my avatar. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, there's a, actually, if you ever get a good chance, I'm trying to, I'm looking at the, I can't read the author's name right now, but there's another book called You'd Really, Really, Really Like. Uh, called Quantum Sorcery Basics. Okay. And all it does is it combines pretty much of what we're doing with the, you know, with the concept of the old grimoires and old texts and whatnot, and uh, combines it with modern sciences. And it's actually, it's really an interesting approach to it. Oh, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, while you were out getting coffee, I pointed out to everybody that Remote View and the Complete User's Manual is available for $9 on Amazon and Kindle form. Mm. It's cheap. Nice. Yeah, in the 90s when the funding stopped, uh, and because I was living in Atlanta at the time, uh, and back in the days of BBSs and whatnot, we were uh, uh, we had an open open forum with the remote viewers out of Atlanta, and it was very enlightening. Very cool. Actually, All right, this the... is our last last twenty five minutes. Sometimes we can go over, but I can't tonight, unfortunately. So <laughs> let let's let's pick the, let's pick some a topic you're interested in. Uh, that's that's kind of hard. <laughs> I'm like all over the map. <laughs> well, well, well some, something you want our audience to know. That would be cool. Uh, well, I, I'm going to continue on with that Fleur story, and uh, that's a good that's a good plan. Yeah, because uh, because I don't think people a lot of people don't know what forward looking infrared is. Yeah, and also I want to explain the perceptions that uh, are often misleading with paranormal investigators by this this story so so we'll just have dave let you pick up right there and sure. keep going until you run out of steam and then we'll figure out where where to segue <laughs> okay <laughs> all right we got uh, about uh 45 seconds here gentlemen 45 seconds i'm looking forward to it oh yeah mm -hmm. all right uh, make sure both you guys stick through the bottom of the hour break so that way we can say goodnight to you uh, via uh, after the show just because that's what we like to do. And oh. thank you, Science Bob, Max, and Brett for the Super Chats tonight. 73 likes. Thank you so much for everybody who's given us a thumbs up, thumbs down, and thumbs whatever. And to all of our new subscribers out there, here we go. We got five seconds. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune us on in. We appreciate it, especially those listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio, along with KPNL Digital Radio as well. Don't forget, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. What do we got here? Prandical. Prandical is your password. Use it wisely, Space tra <coughs> Travelers. Excuse me. As the Glam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce Science Bob as Bob McGuire. Dr. Bob McGuire, formerly of Virginia Tech University, joins us once a month to talk about less woo, but the who, what, where, when, why, 
and the how of the paranormal. We are joined by special guest from the Mudutu Effect. We have Matt Lay with us as well. Gentlemen, welcome back. So uh, good to be back. It. So, 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 Matt, at the end of the last hour, you were ter- telling us about forward-looking infrared. So continue, please, for our audience. Um, real quick, uh, Zoe Buttercup. Uh, yes, that's the book. Um, I was just responding to the chat. I'm just a little bit slower on the typing. Uh, what we had was um, uh, a floor all set up in another controlled uh, environment, and it glitched. You know, Fleur does that. Sometimes it does a quick flash on a screen or whatever, and we immediately dismissed it as as an error. And a year later, and this goes back to a conversation that uh, I had with Dave on our previous episode, is a lot of times paranormal investigators go, oh, it's a glitch, and they throw it into the vault, and it disappears, or that was it happened here. It goes into the vault and it disappears. We like to re-review over and over and over and over. And I kept staring at this glitch, and I, it's like it's driving me nuts. So I sent it to um, Fleur, to the engineers, and said, "What is this? What causes this?" Okay, well, this glitch is caused from IR interference. So sure enough, you go through the footage, and there's an IR camera. Uh, an IP camera pointed in that direction. Okay, there's the IR interference. What's this glitch? That, and this goes back to your statement, is high levels of electromagnetic field being generated. Okay, well, everything was off. There's no power. We're using portable power supplies. How can that be? So we freeze-framed it. Well, I freeze-framed it and looked at it, and it was actually a waveform. So I sent it to Fleur again. And I said, well, that's electromagnetic interference. Okay, no, but I want to know what causes that waveform. So I took the waveform and put it in my audio software. And lo and behold, it was um, going back to one of those theories I dismissed. It was plasma electromagnetic fields. Is the same kind of field that you would normally have in the lower ionosphere. Um, you know, you always hear the recording of the planets. If you haven't, look it up on YouTube. They've got all the planets uh, where the uh, atmosphere, uh, where the solar rays hit the atmosphere and create the uh, different tones in the electromagnetic uh, range. Once again, frequencies. So, with that being said, why now we've this glitch that we dismissed for over a year, now we have to sit back and try to understand why we were actually picking up plasma electromagnetic interference during certain points of this controlled experiment. So still don't have the answers, but that's the key point is never dismiss a glitch. You know, uh, you know there was a, another story when uh, I was doing an investigation uh, the lights flickered. Well, immediately you'd go, okay, power, you know, power, bad bulb, whatever the case may be, ballast, you know. But you have to analyze, did it reoccur? What was the sequence of these that happened? You know, all these different factors, because light is a waveform, which once again is a frequency. So was that a means of communication? Was that just a... A, a brownout, you know, you don't really know. So you can't always dismiss a glitch, which you may say, that was really nothing. It could be something very, very important. And I agree with you on that because I know when, when a couple of years ago, uh, Merle from uh, the Paranormal Road Trippers was up here investigating with David Weatherly and Ross Allison and a uh, little Ronnie Moniak from Saskatchewan was there as well, the Ukrainian watermelon. Uh, you know, they were in one of our buildings, and they had been using one of those cameras that gives that pinkish-purple hue. I forget the name mm-hmm. of it. And it glitched. They took 500 photographs with that camera, and there was one picture that glitched. And when they looked at that to try and figure out why it glitched, they looked into the doorway of one of the 
uh, of that photo that glitched, and there was actually an alien gray standing there. Mm. So that's a you know a really good point on the let's go on with science bobs with the consciousness. So we had on this last experiment, we had three cameras cross-sectioning with each other so the IRs would not interfere with each other. The very second the east quarter was called, the uh, camera in the east quit recording. Never, didn't shut off. It was still connected. And this is where I'm going to give props to Steve, and Science Bob is going to love this part. So he sees where it quits recording. He sees it's still connected. He sees full bars. He immediately goes to, because we had our full range spectrum analyzer running as well. And we set up an antenna array underneath the floor so we can detect uh, anything going on. So he immediately goes and he looks at the camera, says, okay, it's operating 2.4 range. He goes to the spectrum analyzer. He sees if anything's uh, interfering. He doesn't see anything interfering in that range. Now he's recording everything of why this is, um, uh, why this camera quit recording all of a sudden. So that's where Steve, I love him to death. He's OCD just enough to catch all these small things. And he's pivoting between multiple monitors and mu multiple uh, uh, testing devices. And he thinks very quickly, you know, the whys. Why did this happen? So he immediately looks at the spectrum analyzer, looks at that, and he hops over and he looks at the camera, starts troubleshooting it. This very second that ritual was over, the camera started recording. So to go along, which we're saying, Dave, with the, uh, the gray, it goes to the consciousness because how many times we have recorded documentation all over the place that they don't talk to you with a the mouth, they're talking through you with their minds. So, you know, it's no different from the practitioner forming a circle to the person doing meditation. The consciousness uh, connection between all of these different researches are connected. Mm -hmm. So with it all be connected as one, you know, we've talked about this numerous times on this show regarding whether or not there is like an invisible thread that connects all of this together. And if so, is that what you're looking for, that invisible thread? It's, it's more along the lines of, well, I'm going to answer yes, but to step back, to find the frequencies in that band, um, uh, like you, a science bob, I'm a communications engineer, and the, you know, whether or not you're watching TV or surfing the internet or whatnot, there's different frequency bands for the um, download and upload. So all the way from down to where you pressing your remote and sending information all the way back to uh, the head end. So with that being said, there's got to be like a range here and specific threads. I'm going to put an S on into that uh, for specific purposes. And that's what my theory is. So I don't want to add that again, we're agreeing, but to some one extent, we all use different language. So just mm -hmm. let me tell you how the communications engineer in me would approach this, especially with my mathematical background is we can measure not only the existence of your thread, we can measure the strength mm -hmm. and the amount of stuff that's being connected by this thread by measuring the joint information. And so there, I just tell you, we all, as interested people, need to share together in an effective way so that we can get somewhere. But, that, but, but beyond from hypothesis to actual measurement to trying to find a conclusion. And I just think we can get there if we all work together. Oh, I agree. That's what, <clears throat> that's what our hopes is, you know, in doing the, those little short videos. You get to, if you watch those videos on YouTube, you actually get to see my beard grow over time. But um, I don't know if it's scary or laughable. But uh, Beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> Nothing short of beautiful. 
We love beards here. <laughs> but the, you know, the, they go from, and I try to make them somewhat entertaining, even though I can just go on these long rants, um, because uh, the concept here is I'm putting that information out there in hopes that somebody will reach out, watch it, and create their own theories. And well, do, look, Matt, before we get too far, spell out clearly for our audience how they view your videos. Well, they can do it either through the website. There's a link on there, which is at M-U-D-U-T-U uh, dot C-A. Um, you can go straight through there, or you can just go to YouTube and do a search for um, uh, the Medutu effect. And um, uh, it's, but the uh, YouTube channel, we're fixing to relaunch a lot of the videos and whatnot because we've got more data that we want to put out there. And um, also, occasionally, I'll put them on the uh, Facebook page, but the Facebook page is more uh, community-based and, you know, where we put out the lectures, the workshops. I really hate the word lecture. Um, uh, personal preference, because lecture feels like you're presenting on a one-sided wall and a workshop makes you feel like you're part of it and that that's the way I like to do these things because I'm part of it you know you put throw out the information and then you learn it, all, everybody learns from it you know, including myself um, but the Madutu uh, effect videos uh, were designed around not only around the book that I released, but also uh, to create, to generate people to think more and uh, create their own theories. It doesn't matter if you agree or disagree, it's just as long as we're respectful to each other. Very cool. So I went to the madutu.ca webpage and it's easy to find the videos for anybody in the audience who wants to look. And not only that, you can get the uh, Madutu Effect Shop information booklet, and I encourage our our listeners to do exactly that. <laughs> I appreciate it. We make everything here, and, you know, if we can actually mass produce, uh, and I want to put this out there while I'm thinking about it, is anytime we come up with these devices and whatnot for testing, this isn't just for us, because this is one environment. Um, as you know, Science Bob, you want to test these things under multiple different types of environments. And um, so past team, I, I told them they have exclusive rights to anything I release right away. But uh, after they've run through their test, I need more information. So if you run a paranormal team, whatnot, I talked to Merle already. <laughs> but if you run a paranormal team or uh, even with uh, uh, UFO research or anything along those lines and you feel like any of these things are going to be uh, beneficial to you just shoot me a message we'll get it out to you because that is invaluable we need that information because that's the only way we're going to develop more very cool Dave yeah in, in regards to the research that you want to move forward with is this just about ghosts, Matt? Mm -mm. Uh, no. Um, it, see, I, I don't like the term ghost. I don't like the term spirits. I just call it something. Because at this point in time, that's the variable. We don't know what that variable is. Um, we just know that the interactions are all very similar. And we want to identify that interaction. So once we identify that, you know, that frequency, that sweet spot, a ghost hunter, because um, I even in my book I say I do not like the term ghost hunter, uh, me personally as a label, but a ghost hunter can utilize it the same identical way that... Um, a person researching multi dimensions or a person researching UFOs or, you know, these type of aspects, you know, like that oscillator I mentioned earlier, that device would apply on multiple platforms. So far as me goes, no, I'm not a ghost hunter. Um, I just want to know what is out there. Um, 
I just don't, I'm not a fan. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Dave, you're a musician too, so you'll relate to this. If you release music right now, what's the first question they're going to ask you? What genre do you want this in? And that has always annoyed me beyond comparison because I don't want to be classified under a single genre, you know, and it's the same concept here. I don't want to be, you know, labeled as a ghost hunter or a UFO researcher or, you know, I want to know, I want, I don't want the label. I just want to be labeled as a researcher and an investigator. <laughs> I understand that. It's kind of hard to do that considering everything is paranormal than what we deal with. So you're automatically going to be labeled as that. <laughs> but, you know, I, I can also respect the fact, too, that you don't want the title. You just want the research mm -hmm. to speak for itself. See, I, and I, I go back to what I was saying on Brett. You know, everybody just nicknames me the wizard. Yeah, so we'll just go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. Whatever works, you know, I mean, we, we could definitely, definitely look into that in regards to it. But, uh, you know, as we got five minutes to go here on Science Bob and Friends with special guest Matt Lay tonight. Matt, for people who are amateur investigators out there, and maybe they want to take it a step further like you have, what advice do you have for them? Read. Um, yeah, don't be afraid. Don't get hyped up on the media fear that's generated. Um, don't be afraid to open a book, um, uh, or do your own research. Uh, step away from the tube. Oh man, I just said my age, you know, step away from the TV <laughs> and, you know, and do your own research. Come up with your own theories. Um, you know, it's not all about the blinky lights. It's not all about uh, the demon that's going to possess you if you go into a dark house. Um, it's more about what you're willing to learn and what you're willing to share. Um, because what you do learn out of your experience and that data, there's probably somebody else out there that's had the same identical experience and also had the same inhibitions to share that information. Science Bob. Okay, so Matt, I uh, well, can't wait to uh, get to the place where we will uh, be able to interact and exchange ideas. I've looked at your website, and I do have some ideas, and I can't wait until Canada decides we're not uh, typhoid Marys if we're from the United States and we can come <laughs> north and visit. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be beyond awesome. We got the space here, so lots of room, lots of room, lots of room for science, Bob, and the scientific experiments that goes on. And Matt, you know, you being in in the central part of Western Canada, me being on the west coast here in central British Columbia, for you being an investigator coming out of the United States, where where the the paranormal has literally been investigated nearly everywhere how much of a gem is canada for the paranormal oh this has been amazing uh, once again uh grew up in the south so a lot of things that you may bring up are kind of taboo you know with the whole um uh you're not supposed to do this you're not supposed to do that um i moved away from alabama uh when i was young and no matter where you were in the South, it was the same way. So here it, in Canada, it's a lot more open-mindedness. And um, uh, I'm just really been, uh, it's really been a blessing being up here. But for the fact that, are, are you still amazed at how much paranormal virgin territory there is up here? I mean, there there are towns and buildings and everything that have, never ever been investigated oh agreed and there's also you know i don't know about there i can only speak about uh saskatchewan but there's a, there's towns that are uh it's a whole bunch of ghost towns that have never been uh uh investigated so there's been some that have been exploited but <laughs> you know because there's no money if there's no ghosts to some people but uh but 
you know, the thing is, is that here in Saskatchewan, there's tons of stories that just are endless. And um, there's a plenty of opportunity or places. Uh, the crooked trees, for example. Uh, I'm dying to get out there. I want to test the magnetic fields. I want to check for time distortions. I want, you know, I really want to dig into some of these places. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Matt, once again, as we are into the final minute here, do us a favor and tell everybody where they can find the Madutu effect. On Facebook, if you look on Facebook uh, pages, it'll be listed as House Madutu because it's a big house. And uh, uh, on the website is mudutu.ca. And um, on the Facebook page, also we have a toll free number and a telephone number that you can reach us. Um, uh, we don't have an online store yet, but, uh, there's an item that you're looking for, um, uh, specifics, just leave us a message and we can go from there. Not a problem. And science, Bob, another great show with you tonight. We will talk to you next month, my friend. This was very enjoyable, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us and come back to visit in Alabama and I will do the same. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, my mom's still down there, so I have to visit. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for being on Spaced Out Radio. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire. We have the Thought of the Dave, a jam-packed final half hour. Coming up right here on the Mighty SOR as we round the corner and start to head for home. Great show, gentlemen. Great show. That was fun. Oh, yeah. Lots of fun. Immensely. Lots of fun, man. Lots of fun. Uh, I appreciate you guys, man. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. And uh, we will talk to you guys very, very soon. All right, Dave. Take care. And Matt, once again, thanks so much. I look forward to t- talking to you and interacting. Oh, please do. Oh, I got a lot to talk to you about. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to bed. i got to get up early. All right, boys, take care. Take care. Bye. All, All right. right, thanks. Good night. Great show by them. Great show. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a fantastic show. Fantastic show. Science Bob always steps up to the plate. It's a home run. Matt Lay came in, you know, he was stealing second, stealing third, and he even stole home there. I like my baseball cliches. So that's pretty impressive. Very impressive with these gentlemen. And, uh, you know, it's uh, another great show here on Spaced Out Radio. I think so, at least. But then again, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm a little biased. I'm a little biased. I'm hungry. I am hungry. Hey, Johnny Rebke. What's going on? Thanks, Kev. Oh, there he is. Big Bad Matt. There he is. Check out his beard with the Mudutu effect. <clears throat> Tomorrow night on the show, who do we have? Leonard David. Leonard David we got. So that way uh, we are going to be talking some UFOs tomorrow night. Uh, Corn's the booking guy. I will be calling you after the show. All right. I will. Yes, I will. Corn's the booking guy.
Oh, I've done the fasting for surgery before. That sucks. Hate that. Hate that. I said, Corrin's the booking guy. Attention, Corrin's the booking guy. I will be phoning you after the show. All right, we got like one minute. <clears throat> hey, Justin, how you doing? Allison Ford, the pride of Saskatchewan. She wears a wet watermelon on her head during the winter, especially during football season. All right, everyone. Thank you, Science Bob, Max, and Brett for the Super Chats tonight. We're going to kick off the news here. And uh, let's do this thing like, I don't know, right now. Yeah, right now. Rounded third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning us in on the show tonight. Want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Speaking of the news. Each and every night we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange the wacky, and sometimes the tasteless. Yeah, the tasteless. Anyways, two United States-based retailers up here in Canada made the mistake of offering Remembrance Day sales to their Canadian customers this year, a practice one retail analyst called horrible and disrespectful. Canadians are very sensitive about the commercialization of this sacred holiday. Independent retail analyst and consultant Bruce Wintertold has stated, Certainly in Canada, it's been taboo to have any type of sale on Remembrance Day for the obvious reason that we're remembering our fallen soldiers. Lenovo's, Canada's or Canadian facing site, says that our biggest Remembrance Day sale ever is coming in 2020 and asked customers to sign up. Lenovo's head office is in Beijing, and his operational headquarters is in North Carolina. Customers of the window blind retailer Blinds.ca could get a fourth window blind free if they bought three under the company's Remembrance Day sale, which was originally supposed to end November 11th. At Blinds.ca, we have the utmost respect for military veterans, their families, and their sacrifices, wrote spokesperson Kathleen Hartnett, who is based in Houston, we apologize to our Canadian shoppers for any disrespect that this has caused, and we have removed the sale from our site. Lenovo did not respond to any media requests. Now, Remembrance Day sales have been a controversial one in the past. Veterans and their organizations condemned similar sales by Eddie Bauer in 2010 and The Gap in 2014. While we are supportive of retailers who wish to show their thanks to our veterans, we would not want to see an actual commercialization of Remembrance Day or of the Remembrance period itself, Royal Canadian Legion spokesperson Nujma Bond said in a statement. 
Grocery chain Whole Foods reversed a controversial ban on employees wearing poppies last week after political leaders, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Ontario Premier Doug Ford, condemned it, Trudeau calling it a silly mistake. Way to get mad there, Justin. You really made them change their minds. Winter and Ryerson University historian Peter Vronsky point out that Veterans Day sales are common in the U.S. around November 11th and say that companies that seem to have carried the concept to Canada without paying enough attention to cultural difference. In the United States, traditionally, Memorial Day and Veterans Day are holidays in a strange way, he says. That's their cultural tradition, but Remembrance Day was never really a holiday in that sense of the word here. This was a solemn memorial, a dark day, The Americans have a little bit of a different approach. I think there's a much more solemn sense of what Remembrance Day stands for, and it's definitely not going shopping, certainly. I agree with this. I totally agree with this. And you know what? Even in the United States, I don't think there should be any shopping on Veterans Day or Remembrance Day up here in Canada. No, don't agree with it. I think it's an over exertion of the rights of freedom i do pay respect it's one day out of the year it's like companies who open on christmas day don't like it don't like it at all let's just let's just be man you can afford to have two days off in 365 days in a year sometimes 366 that's my opinion moving on On Japan's northernmost island of Hokkaido, one town has installed a robot monster wolf to protect residents from encroaching bears. The scarecrow wolf is equipped with a motion sensor that, when tripped, spurs the metallic beast into a red-eyed howling sequence. The cyber wolf was created as a joint project between Hokkaido-based machinery firm Ota Seiki and Hokkaido University, along with the Tokyo University of Agriculture. Bots were first placed on Hokkaido farmland in 2016 to fend off wolves and other predators from livestock. Now there are more than 62 monster wolves across Japan. However, Takikawa's recent installation is the first meant to protect humans. We want to let bears know human settlements aren't where you live and help with the coexistence of bears and people, says Yuji Ota, head of the Ota Seiki in the interview with uh, Mainchi, yeah, the, the Princess Monoki gone metal idea of beast man and machine living harmoniously has worked in wildlife management before, according to Dave Thau, global data and technology lead scientist of global science at the World Wildlife Fund. Although a new science, Thau says robots are enhancing global conservation efforts. From swimming the depths, picking up trash, to gathering insights of the backs of flying beetles. Many of these applications are very new and not yet widely deployed, making it an exciting time for any conservation-minded roboticist. Yeah, we are using technology to monitor biodiversity and environmental health, as well as helping reduce illegal exploitation of wildlife and reduce human-wildlife conflict. For the town of just more than 36,500 residents, bear sightings were extremely rare. There's typically one sighting every few years, but this year, since the end of May, there have been 10 in town alone. While there's no real conclusive reason as to why there's an uptick, the Japanese Times reports a similar surge in the Hokkaido town of Shimamaki. Takikawa officials have placed a four-foot-long, three-foot-high scarecrow in the neighborhood just outside of the city center. It will remain there until hibernation season begins at the end of November. How about you kind of live in the bear's territory? Make the sacrifice. You be a t- pay attention to them. They don't need to pay attention to you. That's what we do here where I live. Seriously. Leave the bears alone. And hopefully the wolf doesn't scare them away. A Georgia woman is facing charges after police say she posed as a federal agent and demanded free food from an employee at a local Chick-fil-A. 47-year-old Kimberly Ragsdale, who definitely does not look like a government official, 
was arrested and charged with impersonating a public officer after employees dialed 911 following her latest attempt to score a complimentary meal. She was booked November 5th in the Polk County Jail and released on $3,000 bail after a two-day stint behind bars. Online jail records show authorities said Ragsdale kept up the ruse even as she was being arrested, at one point pretending to talk into a radio supposedly hidden under her shirt and urging the FBI to send someone to her aid, according to the Polk County Standard. She also claimed her credentials were electronic only, when officers asked to see identification. We are thankful for the observant and professional staff at Chick-fil-A who knew what to do and gathered the info needed for us to make our case and catch her in the act, Police Chief Randy Turner said. We would like to inform all of our citizens to call 911 if someone is claiming to be an officer if they aren't in a marked car or in a proper uniform or if they don't have the proper credentials. Turner said Ragsdale had been trying to score free meals at the restaurant all week and threatened to arrest employees who refused. The police chief added that officers appreciate free or discounted meals but will not make threats and demand the free food. I should hope not. Flying taxi startup Lilium will set up its first U.S. hub near Orlando, Florida, putting more than 20 million Floridians within range of the winged electric aircraft that could fly and take off vertically, cover 185 miles in a single one-hour loop. Munich-based Lilium has stated its first U.S. vertiport would be at Lake Nona, a futuristic smart city being built near Orlando International Airport by the Tavistock Development Group. The hub, due to start operation in 2025, would be Lilium's second after a similar vertiport planned in Dusseldorf, capital of Germany's most populous state of North Rhine-Westphalia. Startups are racing to develop, certify, and manufacture electric aircraft in a bid to revolutionize short-range travel. Five-year-old Lilium, with $375 million in investors funding, is one that of the best back. Its five-seater Lilium jet has undergone flight tests, and if approved for service, would offer travelers a way to skip traffic and quickly reach their destinations for around a cost of an Uber, said Chief Operating Officer Remo Gerber. The fixed-wing aircraft, powered by 36 electric engines, which point down for takeoff and tilt to the rear for horizontal flight, would be steered by qualified pilots. It's 100 times safer than helicopters. Pricing is 5 to 10 times cheaper, Gerber has stated. Power use for the distance covered is similar to electric vehicles, while because there is no runway, the cost of Veriport here is far lower than traditional airport, ranging from 1 to 2 million euros for a basic landing zone to 7 to 15 million euros for a major rooftop hub. Lilium's core mission of transport, which not only supports bringing the region together, but also provides a solution to environmental issues, is incredibly impressive, said Tavistock Managing Director Ben Weaver. The city of Orlando is backing the project, which Mayor Buddy Dyer described as an expansion of safe, efficient, and environmentally transportation options throughout one of the fastest-growing regions in the country. I think this is a great idea. I do. It will sure help in congestion. Question is, how long will it take for those airplanes to power up? If it's anything like a Tesla, that's like four hours between trips. That's I don't know how that's cost efficient, though. Anyways, moving on. The United States Air Force envisions placing laser weapons systems on fighter jets by the mid-2020s. The service is banking on a defense contractor's shield laser system a pod-mounted laser that will protect fighters from incoming missiles. This system will likely be used at first anyway to protect older fighters that can't take advantage of stealth to hide from the enemy. The system is called SHIELD, or Self-Protect High Energy Laser Demonstrator. Yeah, SHIELD is a pod-mounted laser developed by Lockheed Martin on behalf of the Air Force Research Laboratory. Mounted on the fuselage or the wing of a fighter, S.H.I.E.L.D. can shoot down incoming air-to-air or air-to-surface missiles. That's kind of cool. Today's fighter jets are largely limited to passive defenses against incoming missiles. Pilots can take evasive action and try to fly outside an incoming missile sensor arc, launch flares to distract an infrared missile seeker, or spread strips of aluminum foil known as chaff to confuse a missile guided by radar. 
A laser would be the first real active anti-missile defense in the world of air combat, actively trying to shoot down a missile. Shield is a pod-mounted system, meaning it could take up station on a fighter jet, typically reserved for bombs, missiles, or sensor pods. That makes it a bad fit for stealthy aircraft such as the F-22 Raptor or the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, as the pod will break up the plane's carefully minimized radar signature. That said, both planes already have a missile defense system already built in with stealth technology. Instead, S.H.I.E.L.D. will likely go on to fighters such as the F-15s, the F-16s, the A-10 Warthogs, and more. Traditional, tra- pardon me, trading the ability to carry one or more missile or bombs for a laser that could shoot down many incoming missiles is really a no-brainer. Yeah, either way, that's still kind of cool. A man in Quebec who found a class ring while out metal detecting in an athletic field was able to return the item to its owner, who said it was lost nearly 40 years earlier. Stephen Ambrose said he's been metal detecting in the green spaces of Montreal's Verdun borough for years, and recently he was practicing his hobby in the local athletic field when he unearthed a Verdun High School graduation ring. The ring that I I found was a silver men's ring, and it was fairly deep, so I knew it wasn't lost recently. The ring was engraved with the initials CEW, and the members of a Facebook page for Verdun High School alumni were able to identify the ring's likely owner, Kurt Edward Wakeling. I got a phone call. I got a phone call from a girl that I went to school with, Wakeling said, and she stated, Kurt, did you lose your grad ring? Wakeling said he lost his ring almost 40 years ago, the summer after his senior year. He said he knew exactly where the ring had fallen off his finger, but he had never been sure where it had actually dropped, and he could never find it. It only fits on the pinky now. The other fingers don't have a chance, but it does fit, he said. He said the ring has immense sentimental value to him. It's not about the ring per se. It's the memories. It took me back 40 years, Wakeling stated. A New Hampshire man's class ring was recently returned to him after being lost for an even longer period of time, 53 years. Kathy Rowell of Barrington said her husband Steve lost his Spalding High School class ring in 1967 when it slipped off his finger while he was skipping stones with his brother at Drew's Pond. The pond recently became partially drained due to drought conditions, leading Rowell to enlist the help of neighbors to help search for her husband's lost ring. A neighbor with a metal detector was able to find it in the muck and return it to the couple. That's kind of cool. And finally tonight, finally, oh, sometimes it doesn't pay to be a black bear. Wildlife officials in California say they have captured and relocated a black bear that has become famous online for its repeated visits to a gas station convenience store. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife said the bear, which became a viral celebrity after security cameras recorded it pilfering snacks from inside the Chevron gas station in Kings Beach on multiple occasions, was safely captured and revealed to be a 16-year-old male. Officials said the bear had been relocated to a large expanse of wild, suitable bear habitat. Ann Bryant with the Bear League said she is concerned the bear's relocation could put its life at risk due to a leg injury from a broken bone that did not heal correctly. I think this was not good for the bear, of course. If he was taken to another bear's habitat, that other bear is going to be territorial. This bear is compromised. It's crippled. He's crippled. Well, you know what? It's a wild bear. Sometimes nature has to take its course. But good for them for not killing the bear. No, because, hey, Ann, we wouldn't want that. We wouldn't want that either. Gosh, sometimes people are damned if you do and damned if you don't. Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we get to play a little game here. We ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. What is the connection between all things paranormal? Haunted history, B.C. All things paranormal remind us we don't know everything, can't explain everything that is either out there or around us every day. There are things we experience, see and hear, etc., but can't readily explain within the confines of our current paradigm. Dig deeper, folks. One of our favorite veterans who listens to this show, we love you, Marty, down in Las Vegas. 
He says all categories of the paranormal are united in their ability to avoid the scientific method. Thank you for the clown. Lovely redheaded clown tonight. Yay. Jules, consciousness, Davy. We are. We are what connects all things. We are not just human beings. We are all things and everything and every is us. Katera has confusion. And Uriah thinks there's a lack of scientific research. We're trying to change that, Uriah. We are trying to change that. Moving on. And let's go here to our Facebook crowd. Alex, the connection is people that pretend all things are connected so they could go on radio and TV shows and sound like experts without having taken the time to do the actual field work. Always so positive, Alex. He always writes that with his shirt off, too. Brian, superstition, fear, ignorance, insolent faith. Jason, they're all part of man's great truth. Debbie, our brain and minds. Kimberly, I think it's that they must exist in another universe, as you never see two of them occur at the same time, so they must share the same energy in some way. Cheryl, the connection to the universe consciousness, it permeates all things everywhere and every when. Very evidence strongly suggests that there's an endothermic type of energy that could do work without the production of heat and can access the past, present, and future information remotely. Such evidence indicates that our long-term memories are not stored in our brain, but in an external zero-point power field, and the way we access our memories is, in itself, paranormal. Gabe, most likely it has something to do with energy. Deborah believes it's consciousness. Coral, there's got to be something that connects it, but I haven't a theory yet on what that is. Allison, plasma. It's plasma, right? Grant believes it's the force. Kimberly, we're 3D. They aren't. Carrie, we just have a limited spectrum that we can see, hear, etc. You can't see or hear radio waves, but they are there. Need tools to track and trace. Don calls it cl- complicated. Eugene, the interaction of time and space with one's thoughts and one's level of consciousness. Time is motion, and motion and thought are a unity. Gail, what if there is no connection other than that we all seem to exist on some plane or another? I mean, I don't even know how an earthworm and I are connected. This is way too deep for me. Sir Can, it's not paranormal because it exists. Is its existence is out of the norm because its normal nature is to be unseen and goes against the norm if it is seen. Mark, they are brought to light on SOR? Maybe. Kim, all things. It's amazing when you can see it working. Bernadette, a person's mind. William, the National Enquirer. Crypto Guru, frequencies and vibration. Kim, we live in a multiverse. Jay, which universe do you want that answer to come from, Dave? Christine, Knowledge, Communication, and Dave Scott. Who? Who? Anyways, thank you to everybody taking part in the Thought of the Dave. We will do it all again tomorrow, so make sure you tune on in. Big thank you to Captain Shirk for the SOR Newswire and to Science Bob and Matt Lay for a great Science Bob and Friends. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody in our chat rooms tonight. Spreaker, YouTube, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club on our website, and all the Starkers and Starkettes hanging out on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. All of you were marvelous tonight. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, say it with me, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But tomorrow, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. 
your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we got room for them too. Good night.